Good morning, friends, and a warm welcome as we gather together here in the sanctuary and at home to worship God. Welcome especially if this is your first time with us or your first time in a while. Everyone is welcome to stay for a cup of tea and coffee and continue chanting after the service. Just to say that the Macmillan Coffee Morning that was held at the Muse uh, through the week raised £730. So... So thank you to all who attended and also all those who donated. Also can I say many thanks to all those who have helped make the sanctuary look so lovely for today's harvest service. Thank you to all those who have donated flowers and plants and for all the items that have been handed in for the lodging house mission. I'm hoping that uh, Jim and Joyce have got a truck with them this morning, not just the car, because they're going to need it. Also thanks to all those who will prepare the gifts later on and to all those who will deliver them. Elders are asked to collect gifts that they have requested between 1pm and 2pm today and I'm just going to look and see if that's a good... Okay. Round about between 1 and 2pm. Volunteers are still needed to look after the various groups that use our halls, especially for one-off events. So it's not if you volunteer, you'll be doing every Saturday from now till... No. <laughs> it's for one-off events. I, was ne- I nearly said the C word and I avoided it. Um, so for dates, times and further information, please speak to Eunice. Any time you can give. So we can even split, if it's a four-hour, we can split it into two two-hours. Any time you can give will be greatly appreciated. It allows these groups to meet in our halls, which is a great offer, great thing to offer to the community, and it also brings in income for the church. Last week I mentioned a one-man play called If Prison Walls Could Speak, which is being performed at Burnside Blair Beth Church next Sunday, 6th of October, at half past six. It lasts for about an hour and a half. Information is on the notice board at the front doors. I did watch a short video clip of it online and what I saw was a multimedia presentation. So not just one person sitting there talking for an hour, but quite a lot going on in the background as well. Tickets are £8 for adults and under 18s are free. Finally, Lois and Martin, who many of us will know and who are here this morning along with Peyton and Vincent, are inviting us to their wedding ceremony this Saturday here in the church at half past 12, 5th October, this Saturday here in the church. So it'll be great to see a few of us there to celebrate their big day and uh, they're looking forward to it, I know. Still to practice for it, but I'm sure that'll go well. Thank you, John, for this morning's intimations. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church, either in person or online. It's lovely that you've joined us on on this. It's not really a bank holiday weekend, but the September weekend, so it's lovely that everyone's here. I would just like to echo my thanks to everyone who's donated to both the flowers for folks in their parish and for the donations to the Lodging House Mission. I know that they really will make a difference in the lives of some of Glasgow's most vulnerable. So a huge thank you to everyone who's donated. Uh, Just a wee date for your diary, a little bit further ahead. We're going to do the Tear Fund Big Quiz this year. So it's Saturday the 16th of November. The Tear Fund Big Quiz. Quizzes are great. Do you know how competitive we get at quizzes? They're wonderful. So we're looking for teams. So... Could be any, it could be the people you live in, in, your, in your street. It could be a group that you're a part of. It might just be you and your friends, a, a family. So please get some, get some heads together, get some teams. And, you know, it's a great way to raise funds for a very good cause as well. And we'll have a bit of fun on the night. So I'll, I'll, I'll intimate it over the next few weeks. But that's the Tear Fund Big Quiz on the 16th of November. Now also, just to let you know, after the service next week, I'm on annual leave for two weeks. So pastor will cover 
and the services on the two Sundays I'm away are going to be covered by Raymond, John, Eunice and the worship team. So I'm away. Um, if you do phone me, then it will die. Well, it won't divert, but I'll give you Raymond's number, but you've probably got Raymond's number. But after the service next week, uh, I'm off for two weeks. So these are all my intimations. So let's still ourselves in God's presence this morning. We come into God's presence giving thanks this day. We are here to give God our praise. These are moments of thanksgiving as we thank God for all that he does for us. His love is never ending. God is good. We are his people led by his spirit. He is our creator and sustainer, our protector. These are moments of thanksgiving as we thank God for all he does for us. His love is never-ending. God is good. On this day of the harvest, we bring our gifts to God from us, his people. God has shared his promises with us, his blessings, and brought us to this place together as one body. So let us give thanks to God this day. Let us worship him now. And we worship God now as we sing our first hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King, singing verses 1, 3, 4, and 7.
Let's worship God now in prayer. Let us pray. Bountiful God, we gather together in your presence this morning, online and in person. We come with our different stories, our different backgrounds, different experiences. We come with an expectation, hungry for an encounter with you, eager to hear your truth. Open our eyes and ears this morning to the presence of your Holy Spirit. May the seeds of your word scattered among us this morning fall on fertile soil. May the truth of your word take root in our hearts and lives and produce an abundant harvest of good words and deeds so that when we sow the seeds of your word, those around us will see your love for them in action. Loving God, help us through the guidance of your Holy Spirit to see where best to sow the seeds of your word, where it will fall on the rich soil and take root in the lives of others. And as we remember that just as we sow your seed into the lives of others, your seed is constantly being sown into our lives. So forgive us then for the times when our lives are like the rocky ground or the thorny ground. When we allow the distractions or temptations of this world to draw us away from your will for our lives. Loving God, we thank you that your love for us is steadfast. Your mercy is unending. Your faithfulness eternal. All of which is possible through the life, death and resurrection of your son Jesus Christ. Who taught us to say the version we are familiar with together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Hands up who likes pizza. I think most people like pizza, don't they? Hands up who's had a pizza delivered to their house. Yeah, quite a few of us. I mean, the good thing about that and, and other fast food you know, kind of outlets is that you make the phone call or you place your order online and within a relatively short period of time, the food's delivered to your door. I mean, it's a fantastic service, isn't it? It really is. Food's maybe only travelled a couple of miles. I mean, with us... We've got two fantastic takeaways, about 30 seconds walk, and you can see the effect it's having on me. I'm having to go on the bike nearly every day now. But I used to work for a pizza delivery company. If you remember a few weeks ago, there was an image of a pizza delivery company. That was the one I worked for. And from the order being taken to the pizza being delivered to the person's home, we only had 30 minutes to make sure that it was delivered. If we were later than 30 minutes, they got the pizza free. So you can bet that most people wanted that pizza to be later than 30 minutes. So to help us with that, we only delivered to a five mile radius to try and ensure that the pizza was delivered within that 30 minute time frame. So although the cooked pizza only traveled a few miles from the shop to the customer's house, the ingredients on that pizza probably travelled a lot further. So I've got a few items that go on a pizza, that go into the ingredients of a pizza this morning, okay? And it's to see if we know how far these items have travelled, okay? So I've got some of the most popular ingredients and in, in three that are absolutely necessary to go into a pizza. So the first one, here we go. Flour. Okay. So, most of our flour, over half of our flour, comes from North America. So that is, how many miles do you think North America is? How many thousands of miles? 
four, five thousand miles. So our flour, a lot of our flour for pizza, travels nearly five thousand miles. Okay? So that's for the base. We need the flour for the base. Then I know you get different sauces, but the classic one, tomato sauce. Okay, you can get white sauces on pizza, but tomato sauce. Now, this tomato sauce came from Italy. So how far away do you think Italy is, roughly? Three, three hours. <laughs> Nora walks very quickly. Uh, about a thousand miles. So the sauce travelled a thousand miles. Then the next ingredient that you kind of need on a pizza, you've maybe guessed it, mozzarella cheese. You need mozzarella cheese on a pizza, don't you? The stringy cheese that when you pull it up, it kind of stretches, it melts. So, where do you think the mozzarella cheese came from? It came from Italy as well. So that has travelled about a thousand miles, okay? So we're getting on to the toppings now. Now, I know everyone's going to have their favourite topping. I've got three of the most popular, okay? So the first one, hope you can see that. Onions. Not everyone likes onions on a pizza, I know that, but onions. Now, these onions came from Spain. So Spain, how far away, how far away, do you, how many miles do you, you think Spain is away? It's the same as Italy. How many do you think? A bit of, well done, about a thousand miles, spot on. So these onions travelled a thousand miles just to go on your pizza. Next one. Peppers. Again, not everyone likes peppers. But these peppers came from quite a bit further away. Anyone want to guess what country these peppers came from? It's quite far away. Not South America. Begins with I. Not Ireland. Think spicy food. <laughs> India. These peppers came all the way from India just to go on your pizza. Six and a half thousand miles those peppers travelled. Now, I don't want anyone to get upset this morning, okay, for the final ingredient. <laughs> You've maybe guessed what it is already. Pineapple. Right, hands up who likes pineapple on their pizza. Hands up who really doesn't like pineapple on their pizza. I think we've got more pro-pineapple than against. It, it, it really does split the room. And we're, we're going to Rome for a week. I can assure you I will not be asking for pineapple on my pizza in Rome. But that pineapple, it came from really far away as well. It came from the Philippines, which is about the same distance away as India. So 6,000 miles. So all these ingredients, now I know you can get them from closer, but if you made a pizza with these ingredients here, 21,000 miles. All of these ingredients have travelled. So although your pizza was maybe only delivered from a mile or maybe a couple of miles away, the ingredients travelled 21,000 miles. And with the exception of the onions and the mozzarella, we'll be putting these into the Lodging House Mission Appeal as well. A lot of the food that we eat, when you go into the supermarket, you can see where it came from. You can see the country that produced it. Or sometimes, if you look, if you're really sad and have too much time on your hands, if you read the labels, it will show you the country it was produced in and then the country it was packaged in. And they can be two different countries. So food, to get onto our plates or into our supermarkets, can travel literally from the other side of the world. And because we can move things so fast now, in one way, that's great because we can have so many ingredients that we never used to be able to have all year round. We can have these ingredients all year round. I mean, do you remember? It wasn't that long ago when you went into the supermarket, you were really quite limited as to the fruit and veg you could get because back then, fruit had a season. And if it was out of season, the, the fruit and veg just wouldn't be available. Whereas now, 
you can basically get everything all year round, which means there's more choice for us, which is really good. But it also has a negative impact on the environment because of the fuel that's used, the time that it takes to get these ingredients to us. So there's advantages and there's disadvantages. We are very fortunate that we can basically go to either shop across the road and get our shopping, get kind of what we need, or we can go to one of the nearby supermarkets. But we know that not everyone is as lucky as that. We know that some people rely on the food that they grow to eat. And again, we know that in certain parts of the world, because of the weather, crops fail. Sometimes there's too much water and they flood. Sometimes there's not enough water and the crops can't grow. So there's a lot of people, as we know, don't have the luxury of having the, the range of food that we do. But it's beginning to affect us as well. One of my colleagues, Chris um, Blackshaw, is the, is the minister to the farming community. And I got in contact with Chris saying, would any of the local farms be able to you know, make a wee donation to us for harvest? And he said, because of the weather this year in Scotland, the only crop they would have been able to give was barley. That's the only thing that they would have been able to provide to us. So it's even affecting the farmers in Scotland, the weather. So it's something we need to, we need to think about. So this harvest, yes, let's give thanks to God for the, the abundance of food that we can, we can have access to. But let's also think how far our food has to travel and the disadvantages of that, as well as those people who don't have the same choice that we do. And as we've done today, let's see what differences we can make in our lives to help the people who are less fortunate both in what they're, what they're able to grow and eat and also what people have. Amen. Our next harvest hymn, it's a, it's a children's hymn. It's called Pears and Apples, Sweet and Grapes. Some of you maybe sang it at school. Jonathan's going to play it through once, then he's going to sing the first verse, then we'll stand and sing the first verse again. So, Jonathan, over to you. Thank you.
Okay, as the leaders take the children through to Sunday school, why don't you say good morning to one another? Have a wee look round about you. There's maybe someone you've not seen for a wee while and wish one another a good morning and welcome to church. verse 10 to 13. My word is like the snow and the rain that come down from the sky to water the earth. They make the crops grow and provide seed for sowing and food to eat. So also will be the word that I speak. It will not fail to do what I plan for it. It will do everything I send it to do. You will leave Babylon with joy. You will be led out of the city in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song, and the trees will shout for joy. Citrus trees will grow where now there are briars. Myrtle trees will come up in place of thorns. This will be a sign that will last forever, a reminder of what I, the Lord, have done. I think I'll just leave that there if you don't want yeah, yeah, to. Yeah, if you just want to. Just sit for me, okay? Sorry, I'm no, in. Just, just sit there. We sing our next harvest themed hymn this morning. We plough the fields and scatter.
second reading this morning is Matthew chapter 13, verse 1 to 13 and verse 18 to 23. That same day, Jesus left the house and went to the lakeside where he sat down to teach. The crowd gathered round him so large that he got into a boat and sat in it, while the crowd stood on the shore. He used parables to tell them many things. Once there was a man who went out to sow corn. As he scattered the seed in the field, some of it fell along the path, and birds came and ate it up. Some of it fell on rocky ground, where there was little soil. The seeds soon sprouted because the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, it burnt the young plants. And because the roots had not grown deep enough, the plants soon dried up. Some of the seed fell upon thorn bushes, which grew up and choked the plants. The plants. Some seeds fell in good soil, and the plants produced corn. Some produced a hundred grains, others sixty, and others thirty. And Jesus concluded, Listen then, if you have ears. Sorry, I think it's the next page. <laughs> Sorry about that. Listen then and learn what the parable and the sword means. Those who hear the message about the kingdom but do not understand it are like the seeds that fell along the path. The evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in them. The seeds fell on rocky ground. Stand for those who receive the message gladly. As soon as they hear it, but it does not sink deep into them, and they don't last long. So when trouble and persecution comes because of the message, they give up at once. The seeds that fell among thorn bushes stand for those who hear the message, but the worries about his, this life and the love for riches choke the message, and they don't bear fruit. And the seeds sown in the good soil stand for those who hear the message and understand it. They bear fruit, some as much as a hundred, others sixty, and others thirty. Amen. Thank you, May, for the, this morning's readings. One of the most intriguing things about music is trying to work out what certain lyrics mean. Do they contain a deeper or even hidden message than the words suggest? Is there some intricate, clever wordplay going on? Or do they just mean what they say? One of the songwriters that was most frequently asked about what their songs meant and if they could explain what this lyric or that lyric meant was Leonard Cohen. But despite being asked this question over and over again, Cohen never revealed what his lyrics meant. He said that he wanted his listeners to hear them for themselves and he wanted the individuals to get something out of it for themselves rather than being told by him what the lyrics mean. Of course, there's other great songwriters and poet and storytellers who are often asked what their words mean as well. And there's a great story when Don McLean finally agreed to what the words of American Pie meant. It was well known that the phrase, the day the music died, referred to the tragic deaths of Buddy Holly, the Big Bopper and Richie Valens. But the, the rest of the lyrics were ambiguous. 
So McLean called a press conference at a university. The place was packed. People were finally going to hear the meaning of one of the most famous but possibly misunderstood songs of the 20th century. McLean sat down, the room hushed in complete silence. And he said, the words to American Pie mean I never have to work again in my life. <laughs> I love that story. And with that, he got up and left. <laughs> the lyrics were deliberately obscure or abstract. We could all hear the same song or read the same poem or the same story, and we could hear different things in the text. And the Bible is no different to that, especially when it comes to Jesus' parables. They were often cryptic with hidden meanings in them and illustrations that he used represented someone or something else than the actual example that he referred to. Jesus wanted the people to wrestle with these parables. He did use examples from everyday life that they could understand. But he wanted them to talk to one another about them. He was saying, what I'm telling you isn't easy. You're going to have to wrestle with this. You're going to have to think about it. Because parables are provocations. They are the opposite of the open and shut examples when we get told the answers, all nice and neatly packaged up. Instead, parables often raise more questions than they give answers. They invite us to use our imagination. They encourage us to explore the text, to unwrap it, and very rarely to take it at face value. What they say to us is, here's a wee story. Let it work on you. Let it work through you. Let it work in you. Think about it. Mull it over. Talk about it. Agree, disagree, challenge or accept. Maybe the story itself will be like the good seed in the parable of the source story that we just heard. Giving good return out of all proportion of its size. So when we read or hear a story such as the parable of the sower... There's many meanings and themes that we could unpack from it. And we could probably all find something different within it. I want us to just think about one thing this morning. I want us to ask one question. Who is the sower in the parable? We're told that it's a farmer that goes to sow seed. But who is the one who is throwing this seed about indiscriminately with apparent wasteful abandon. The seed that they are relying on for their next crop to grow to put food on their table. Seeds that have probably cost the farmer a lot of money on which their future and maybe their family's future may depend. I don't really know anything about farming but I do know seed is expensive. So I've often asked myself, why does the sower sow the seed the way that they do with such little thought as to where the, the seed is landing? But then I have to remind myself that the farmer's prowess isn't the point of the parable. I did hear one, per one person say, a theologian, well, the problem began when it said a man went to sow the seed. That's all I'll say. <laughs> but who is the one sowing the seed? To the left, to the right, here, there and everywhere. Knowing that some of this, the ground is too hard. That there's rocks, that there'll be weeds in another area. But who also knows there is good soil. Which will yield an increase and give a bountiful harvest. 
So let's look at some options this morning as to who the sower could be. Is it God, the Father, the Creator, the Maker of all? We could say yes. We could say that God is forever sowing seed. God is the source of all life. The seed of God is all around us. We heard this in our reading from Isaiah this morning. When God says that his word is like the snow and the rain that waters the crops and helps them grow. And oh, he must really like Scotland with the amount of rain that we get. But we can see God the sower in the endless and infinite works of creation. In the mystery of the gift of life to each one of us. In the events of history and in the life of nature. In the words of scripture. In the song of the church. In the silence of the conscience. The still and quiet place of prayer. The love of our friends. The welcome of the stranger. The words of support from our neighbor. So we could say that God is forever sowing the seed all through creation. And the extravagance of God is truly amazing when we stop to think about it. Or we could ask, is the sower Jesus himself, the storyteller, the teacher? We could say yes. We could say that Jesus is forever sowing seed through the words of his teaching, in the actions of his healing, in his life with the disciples, his life among the crowds. We could say that Jesus is so busy sowing seed in his ministry with the disciples and with others that if he was a farmer, his arms would have been aching all the time. Christ the sower, Christ the seed. If we consider Jesus as the sower, then Lutheran theologian Elizabeth Johnson's comparison between the two I like this. She says, the sower scatters his seed carelessly, recklessly, seemingly wasting so much of the seed on the ground that holds little promise for a fruitful harvest. But Jesus invested in the disciples who looked similarly unpromising. He squanders his time with the tax collectors, the the sinners, the lepers, the demon-possessed, all manner of people all manner of outcasts. Yet he promises that his extravagant sowing of the word will produce an abundant harvest. And we need to remember it was from these groups of people, those on the fringes of what people would consider decent society, the forgotten, the excluded, the ostracized, They were the first ones that took the gospel out into the wider world. So is the sower God? Is the sower Jesus? Or is the sower you? Or me? Or you and me? It might be about our calling as followers of Jesus to sow the seeds of faith in our world. Through our lives, through our words, our actions, our witness and service. Or could it also be the way that faith can grow in each one of us, in our own personal lives, as a community of faith here in King's Park? If we're honest with ourselves, we can probably find evidence of all types of the four soils in our lives at different times, in the congregation at different times. But what's interesting in this parable is Jesus doesn't use the parable to encourage hearers to try and be the good soil. He doesn't do that. Jesus talks about the different types of soil. And he's saying if there's any hope for the unproductive soil, it is that the sower keeps sowing generously, extravagantly, 
even in the least promising places. I did say that the parables get us thinking, don't they? Jesus' investment in his disciples shows that he would not give up on them, despite their many failings. And we trust that he won't give up on us. He will keep working on the areas of our lives that are rocky, that are thorny. His promise is with us right to the end. He never stops. If you look at who we are today as his followers, we are the ones entrusted with Jesus' mission out there. So we might consider the implications of this parable and how we engage in mission. I'm sure we're all familiar with the stories that we hear that the future of the Church of Scotland is grim at best. Well, I don't agree with those stories whatsoever. But perhaps it might challenge how we do mission in an ever-changing society, in a society that wants to push itself as far away from the church as possible because it doesn't think the church or God can offer them anything. So perhaps it's time for us to to take a bit more risks. Even although we know that mistakes will be made. If we follow Jesus' approach to mission, he gives us the permission to take those risks for the sake of the gospel. He endorses extravagant generosity in sowing the word, even in perilous places. And even although we may wonder about the efficiency of his methods, he also promises an abundant harvest. So if we are to model our own sowing after Jesus the sower, we're called to share his teachings extravagantly and indiscriminately, not judging which people or which places are worthy of them and which are not. So who is the sower? Is it God, the creator? Jesus, the worker? Or me and you, his followers? Well, it's not an either or. It's everyone. We are all in this together. And we're reminded of this in John's gospel when it weaves together father, son, and the son's followers In John 17, 21, Jesus says, As you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. A wonderful image of all three intertwining together. So this morning, let's give thanks to God, who is forever sowing the seeds of life, who gave us the second seed, Jesus, and makes us living seed. Let's give thanks to Jesus, the seed and the sower, who sows the seeds of faith among us, calls and commissions us to be sowers ourselves, to sow in places both barren and fertile, and promises a harvest Though the measure of the harvest is his, not ours. And finally, let us give thanks for our continuing part in the work of God, in his world, for sowing the seeds that we receive from God in the lives of others through what we say and what we do. Amen. We can now sow our seeds as we uplift the offering for God's work locally and internationally. Your offering will now be uplifted.
We sing our next hymn this morning, For the Fruits of All Creation. For the fruits of all creation, thanks be to God. For these gifts to every nation, thanks be to God. For the plowing, sowing, reaping, silent growth while we are sleeping. Future needs in earth safe keeping. Thanks be to God. In the just reward of labor, God's will is done. In the help we give our neighbor, God's will. of caring for the hungry and despairing in the harvest we are sharing God's will is done Let us pray. Creator God, we thank you for your harvest which feeds us so many times each day that we are nourished with your forgiveness and hope, sustained with your strength and patience, filled with your grace and compassion. We thank you for feeding us with a harvest of plenty that we are restored through your generosity and healing, replenished with your abundance and joy, and that we are reminded of your selfless abandon. We thank you for the feeding us with the bread of heaven, that your gift of Christ sustains our lives. His presence restores the promise of your love. His life fills our hearts with your everlasting light. We thank you too for filling us with the water of life. May we drink deeply that our thirst may be quenched. And may that river of life continue to flow over us, in us, through us and out of us into the world that you love. But as we celebrate our plenty, help us to remember those who have so much less the poor and needy of our world. Those who are now beginning to have to make decisions between food and putting the heating on. Those who rely on the services offered by the Lodging House Mission and Glasgow City Mission. Those driven by famine, disaster, drought or civil war to the brink of their existence. Help us to respond with love and concern, offering whatever help we can. Lord, you have blessed us richly. Teach us to remember others. So we ask that you would take what we bring to you today and at other times, that it would be used to share your love practically among our own parish and some of the city's most vulnerable residents. 
We also pray this morning for those to whom we owe our harvest, to all who labor, to all whose labor, skill and dedication enable us to share in the bounty of this world's resources, the farmers and fishermen, many of whom are working in increasingly difficult situations and conditions. We ask that they are paid a fair wage for all their efforts. Lord of all creation, speak to us at this harvest time and teach us to share our bounty with those who have little or nothing so that the day will come when everyone will have enough. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Saviour. Amen. We sing our final harvest hymn this morning. Come, ye thankful people, come. As you go from our time of worship together, just as the wild flowers scatter their seeds far and wild, may you, God's people, scatter the seeds of the gospel of hope and truth into the lives of those around you, bringing to growth those good things that are your gifts and promises. And as you go, may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest on you and all your work and worship done in his name, this day and evermore.